Welcome to Insights and Sound, where we talk to the people behind the scenes, behind the technology, and behind the music. People you may not know, but you should. My guest is engineer producer Roger Bashirian. Uh, his career spans multiple decades, um, including some of the original tracks for, let's see, Elvis Costello, Sex Pistols, Squeeze, Undertones, Nick Lowe, Graham Parker, Joe Jackson, a litany of 70s, 80s, new wave rock and roll. <laughs> How's that? Did I do it justice? That sounds great. <laughs> excellent, excellent. Well, um, I will I, I will set the stage here by saying that you and I met uh, during the recording of the Monkees Comeback album mm -hmm. in I guess must have been mid or late eighties, something like that at Cherokee mid -80s, Studios. I think. Yeah, mid eighties. I think. I, yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah, and at Cherokee. Yeah, yeah, and and you know one of the things that I was impressed by then and one of the reasons you stuck in my head a um, couple of things first of all you were very I would say sort of unassuming you know there are a lot of um, there are a lot of producers who work a lot of different ways and um, you know I, I, I took a lot from everybody whose shoulders I was fortunate enough to watch over during the mm. process and you know, one of the things that I, I noted with you was that you had a very, I would say, a very organic approach, not only to the recording process itself, but to the stuff that I consider much more important, which is the, the creative process, the relating to the artist and everything. So um, as an example, you know, what, what started our conversation with me actually asking you what you had done and, and you know, let me, let me preface this by saying that every time I got to look over the shoulder of anybody at a major studio, I kind of tried to have the attitude that whoever this person is, I may not have heard of them, but you've just booked time in a major studio. You've probably got something I can learn from you. So, um, you know, those being my sponge days and wanting to suck up every bit of information I could, um, I believe the conversation, and, and you know, it's been many, many years now, so some of the details are a little bit fuzzy, but mm. I believe the conversation started by me um, talking about the fact that you had moved a microphone rather than, rather than tried to fix something with EQ. <laughs> and uh, your response to me was something along the lines of, yeah, that's how we did it with Squeeze, <laughs> at which point I kind of did a deadpan and said, wait you did squeeze and the conversation went on from there. One of the things that I really was rather impressed with, with a lot of the stuff that I discovered in terms of researching what you had done was that a lot of your approach is very, very spare and very, um, I would say old school from a technical yeah. perspective. Mm -hmm. And a lot of these recordings are, they're not dense. They're very, uh, you can hear every instrument. You can pick out all of the elements. Mm. And that's something that I found very impressive, even when you had, you know, what I would consider kind of dense content. Um, mm. I, I just recently discovered that you had actually worked on uh, the old Lena Lovich cut, Lucky Number. <laughs> yes. Absolutely. Yeah. Which, um, I, I will I will go back several years and date myself and say that at one point I actually auditioned for Thomas Dolby's band back before oh, he was really? Thomas Dolby. Um, <laughs> and I don't even know if he would remember that. It's been so long. But um, I remember thinking at the time, you know, wow, his stuff really has a hell of a lot going on. And that in particular is kind of a dense cut. Mm. And yet everything's right out there. Everything's right in your face. You can pick out everything. And so I, I, I find it interesting the way you approach the recording process. Yeah, it's an interesting thing, isn't it? Um, it is very organic and I, I tend not to have any plan, I think. Generally, I don't have a plan. I mean, I have an idea of what I want to get 
from the band or from the artist and the song, which we've hopefully discussed beforehand, <laughs> and uh, although not always. And um, I think it's, it's interesting you say that th th things, you can hear everything, because actually in my head, when I'm mixing, I, I have this, I, I get to this kind of point that I, it's almost like um, something behind me pushes a button on my skull and actually everything feels very homogenized to me. It feels like a big wall um, of glue. I can hear everything. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting because I just finished an album for a French label and um, they sent me about two months ago, they sent me um, a track as a test. <laughs> And it was, I mean, it had brass strings, fabulous drummer, all kind. it was huge, hundreds of guitars. <laughs> and um, I thought, oh, what am I going to do with this? Anyway, I worked at it for about three days. Just, I didn't spend very much time. I spent about five hours a day just tinkering with it. And I got to the point where that button got pushed and it said, yes, it's working, it's glued, it's great. And I got a call back from uh, one of the producers and he said, this is amazing, you can hear every detail. <laughs> and I was actually thinking, <laughs> it sounds like it's a real, not a mess, but it sounds like it's a blur. But, um, but you're right, somehow, uh, I think that's the reason that um, I like to keep things kind of sparse-ish because um, when you have, especially with guitars, if you have too many things going on, it is really difficult to, for anything to cut through and to, also to make sense. I mean, especially there was a period in the 90s and the early 00s when indie bands love to have like 15 different guitar parts. Wall of guitar. And it's like, what are you going to do with all this stuff? You know, really there's one guitar that should be featured and the others are kind of ancillary to some degree, but even, you know, two or three, fine. But... And it's very difficult to make that work. And it's interesting you, you cite um, Lucky Number because Lucky Number actually has a huge amount of things going on. It does, they're very a lot of subtle. Synth stuff. It's very, very yeah. subtle, yeah. It's yeah. very quite, things kind of come and go. And we did, that was um, Les Chapel actually, Lena's partner. Le Les was really good at that. He kept wanting to add stuff. It's like, Les, we can, no, 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 just in this one bar. Like, okay. Um, and it worked. It actually worked really well. In fact, I got a lot of, having worked with them on that song and then also on the, on the album following it, I, I, I gleaned a lot of information. I think a lot of it stuck with me that you can do things that are kind of, um, that are subtle, but actually they will make a difference to the listener. You'll hear something will make you go, oh, you know, which I think is what good records are all about. You know, it's either a, you know, an incredible band with an amazing rhythm section and a great vocalist. You don't need anything else or you have a lot of stuff going on. We used to call it fairy dust. <laughs> so, yes, yes, exactly. So, you know, you have a choice. But I think um, I like things to kind of evolve. You know, it's all, for me, it's about the artists. And the Monkeys was different because they're session players, really. We were putting the whole thing together. Yeah. But, um, you know, if there's a band or even a solo artist, you know, I'm quite happy to let things run and run and run until either they get bored or there's a spark between everybody. And you know that what that's like with a band, there's this kind of synchronicity suddenly and everything sure. gels and everyone is really happy. You can feel it, you can hear it in the music. And it's it's trying to get to that point that's actually very hard. I don't think you can be a dictator to get to that point. I know some producers that are and they, they swear that's how they get it. And I, I think, well, it's more kind of heavy handed production than, you know, because it's about the artist. It's not about me, it's about their song. You know, so, I mean, I'm there to help facilitate and help to bring things out, but it's not my art, it's their art, you know, and I have a, I have a slant, you know. Yeah, but, but it's interesting that you mentioned that because there is, you know, one of the things that I was talking to you about uh, when we first reestablished contact was mm. that I was very enamored with your methodology you do sort of stand, you know, stand back a little bit and let the artist develop, let the, let the yeah. track develop, let the song develop. And, you know, that's one thing that always fascinated me, especially as I started um, blossoming myself and producing bands. I spent uh, yeah. a lot of years in Germany producing German rock bands, right. which was an experience in itself as well. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, um, you know, there is, 
there are as many different types of producers as there are producers, mm. no doubt, because everybody's got their mm. own methodology and you've got a different methodology with everyone you work with. Mm -hmm. But one thing that I think is always fasc a fascinating challenge is finding that balance of becoming part of the band, you know, in terms yeah. of becoming a fifth member or a sixth, whatever it is, you know, yeah. and at the same time, maintaining a certain degree of, I don't want to say authority, but there is an aspect of that. You mm. know, you've got to be running the show, so to speak. Yeah. You have to keep a lid on things to some yeah. degree. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, I think that's always interesting to me to watch the way, you know, as you say, I mean, there are some producers who are absolute dictators. There are, there are some mm. producers whom you can tell their touch no matter who the artist is you know mm. there's a there's a certain thread running through their productions um you know jeff jeff lynn is one i like to cite you know yeah. a lot of his stuff has a very trademark sound to it uh oh, lang is another one you know mm. um you can definitely tell that it's their production regardless of who the artist is yeah and um there are some producers yourself included who i think are almost on the other end of that spectrum you know, where I'm almost shocked to find out that it was the same producer on these different projects because mm. you've really kind of sat back and let the artist develop and let the artist sort of, I don't want to say take control because obviously you are in control, mm. but, you know, talk to me a little bit about finding that balance when you're working with an artist of, you know, not too much, not too little. Yeah, I think um, it's quite difficult, actually, sometimes. I think um, it, it, you sort of touched on becoming a member of the band, the fifth member or whatever of the band. And I think that's, I think if you're working on an album of material, a lot of material, and you're with people for a long time, um, I think that is very important. There needs to be some sense of um, cooperation, really, and mutual respect for each other. Um, but yeah, finding the balance. I mean, you mentioned Squeeze. That was quite an interesting one. Squeeze were used to um, being in the studio for months, <laughs> making records. Doesn't surprise me. No. Yeah. And um, they were quite sort of, they're very thoughtful about what they did. I mean, Chris was, Chris Difford was you know, obviously the lyricist, you know, very serious about his work. Glenn is a really fantastic guitarist, really lovely guy and a great singer. And they had their way of doing things. And when we got into the studio, because uh, Elvis had kind of was involved in the, in the production, the co-production of it anyway. And uh, he was, he, Elvis was quite cool because he kind of, he was very good at sort of thinking about the meter of lyrics and things like that with melody. So he was, sure. you know, as a writer, that, that worked really well. So the, as a team, we worked really well. But I remember talking to Elvis and saying, you know, we can't spend months in the studio. This has to be done. You know, they need to do something. They need to get off their ass and do something, you know, that's really good and exciting. And so on the first day I spent, I don't know, a little while getting the drums up and Gilson Lavis is a fantastic drummer as well. He was just wonderful to work with. And the drum uh, sound but, on that record is just superb. Yeah, but it's very empty. I think that's mm -hmm. why there's not, there's not actually a, a lot going on uh, apart from the crazy orchestral ones, but there's, there's not very much going on. Um, and they were really freaked out. You know, it's like, that's the one. Are you sure? It's like there was only two takes. <laughs> like, well, come and listen. They come and listen. Yeah, it sounds good. Are you sure it's okay? It's going to be great. And so we started on this roll. And I think on the first day we printed three tracks, three songs. And wow. I'm sure they were like, I'm not sure this is going to work. I, I don't think this is right. And I could see in their faces this kind of, have we picked the right guys here, you know. Just too um, easy. Just too easy. And wow. the, the point was that they were really enjoying themselves, but for some reason they didn't quite get it initially. It took a little while. It took a few days for them to kind of almost unwind, you know, uh -huh. and relax, kind of reset. And it's like, yes, it can be this good and it can be this simple. You just have to go with the flow. And, um, and we had a great time. We started really working really well. The, the only thing that I pulled back on with them was um, 
wanting to do more things like you know glenn would want to do uh another three takes of a solo for instance you don't really need it and i chop a solo together and say this is the one it's great and he'd agree but then he'd want to do something else so at some point i'd pull things in um but it, it wasn't really difficult with them actually but there's you know bands i've worked with that um don't really i think the real issue that you're talking about the balancing act is when a band or an artist doesn't really know what they want they don't know what they want to do isn't that the um, case yeah they've got a great song yeah. they've got some great songs um but they just they haven't actually found themselves yet i think that's the, that's the point and it, that can be quite hard it can be very difficult and the monkeys is a good example because i had the labels wanting a kind of garage band sound and a kind of you know very ropey old 60s sound really and i was like yeah okay i think that would be kind of cool but the band wanted everything to sound as bright and as punchy and as 80s as squeeze and everything else that was going on so i had this kind of balancing thing my first thought was a rather interesting choice of people to produce this i know this band you know well I, I tell you what happened i um I was at home one afternoon and I had a, a phone call from Mickey Dolenz just out of the blue. I don't know where, how he got my number in it, whatever. He called me and said, hi, this is Mickey Dolenz. And I thought it was a joke. And, um, I, you know, me, me and the guys have been talking about making a new record, a comeback record, and we really want you to work on it. We've heard the Squeeze album. This is all came from Squeeze. We've heard, we love it. And we really want you to use that. We'd like to meet. So a few days later, David Jones and, and Nicky Dolan's pull up at my house and we have tea and cake. <laughs> <laughs> we sit and listen How to civilized. some stuff. It was terribly <laughs> civilized. And uh, David brought cakes. And um, we sat and, and talked for like two or three hours. It was incredible and listened to some music. And they really wanted to do something that was very modern. They didn't want to have a kind of retro feel to, to what they were doing. They wanted something that was going to be, you know, it's new, this is us, we're back, you know, it was that kind of thing. And so, okay, the, the problem was there were no songs. Nobody, <laughs> there were no songs written. There were no songs chosen. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> and right up until me landing in LA and driving to um, Santa Monica to meet with Rhino, there were still no songs chosen. And I was in the studio in a few days time makes it a little bit hard to figure out the direction. Exactly. I mean, recently, um, recently, it was a couple of years ago, I worked with um, an Irish artist and he booked some time at a really fabulous studio called uh, Grouse Lodge outside Dublin, a residential place. And I've been listening to his demos and we've been talking about what we were going to do for ages. And then literally at the 11th hour, his drummer and keyboard player dropped out. They couldn't for some reason, they couldn't they couldn't do the session. Now, I knew I had a keyboard player that I've used on loads of sessions. A really great guy, Anthony Clark, and I called him. I said, "You've got to be free to do this because we're actually flying out tomorrow." And he agreed, so he came out. And then we found Phil Wilkinson to play drums, another really really great drummer. Um, and I had I knew Phil, but I'd never worked with him. I knew Anthony, I'd worked with him loads of times, but I didn't know the other two guys in the band, the bass player and the guitarist from uh, Stuart's band. But there was something about putting them together. They all got on really well. And we just ran through some tracks, you know, just running through while mics were being set up and stuff. Um, and they all got on really well. And I started to push the boat out with a few ideas for rhythm and stuff like that, to see where they'd go with it. And it, it was, I have to say, one of the most really lovely experiences and we, we cut the whole album in nine days and i did like i decided to throw all the mics away i recorded the drums with three mics you know i did had guitar amps or everything was distance and you know and close i recorded the acoustic guitar live with the vocal using you know figure of eights and everything and it worked really well and um everyone just had a great time it was this magical moment where things just work and the great thing was i was able to hold the reins and we were all going in the same direction <laughs> that was the really good thing and um, always happen. no and we came out with a with a really tremendous album with a, a top 10 single and you know great reviews the whole thing and the guys are all great friends still and they've been playing together on and off obviously not through the pandemic um and 
that you know and so there are instances where that can work even though you don't know the people involved but they are you know again they're great they're great players and they get it and somehow it knits and as i was saying you get that kind of synchronicity with them all and they just and off they go sure. and we had a blast you know it was incredible i mean nine days is not bad actually but that was everything that was recording everything apart from the vocals so that was um that was that was a bit of a feat really but when as I you say that music. really comes down to the synchronicity of uh, you know whether the musicians can lock together or not and yeah. we've all Absolutely. had that experience you know where um for me i i remember very distinctly just being at a party one time and having a, a drummer who played with a, a another band that we knew in the same town you know and he sat down at, at someone else's kit and i grabbed someone else's bass and you know, about 10 minutes later, we were looking at, and looking at each other, you know, and the musical equivalent of being in love, you know, we were like, mm. why aren't we playing in the same band, you know, and those kind of moments do happen. Yeah, yeah. And that it synergy did. is really great when it does happen. And when it happens in the studio, and you can capture it, that's mm. nothing short of amazing. But, you know, you can also get train wrecks just as easily. Yeah. And that's what you're always trying to do. I mean, you know, another experience I had, not so long ago this was a rockfield sort of home from home studio really and um potentially a great band but it, it was just i ended up just hitting my head against a brick wall because no matter what i suggested or what kind of turn or angle to try or experiment everything was shot down they just did everything as the demo was hmm. and it's like guys this is really not you know this is not moving forward we need to you know they wouldn't have it and i you know perhaps they didn't like me i don't know it just it just didn't work and i found it very very frustrating i did two songs that i didn't do anymore i wouldn't do anymore it was pointless and you know those are really frustrating and sad times because i think they had great potential they had some really good songs they were all really good musicians the singer had a wonderful voice but they just i don't know what it was they just wouldn't try you know and that, that's that's kind of sad because music is it's like any, my wife is a, well, she's a psychotherapist, but she's also an artist. And uh, she's a trained um, sculptor and painter. You know, and I watch her paint and she's they're always moving things around. You know, it's, one day I think, oh, that looks cool. The next day it's something else. It just, you know, and that's what music is too. Music is, is. there to be played around with, you know. It is, it's, it's, you know, a friend of mine once called it problem solving, you know, because yeah. we, we sit and we, play with arrangements and we play with certain parts and uh, you know if, exactly. if you change this then that needs to change and mm. you know i think there is certainly a science to it in that sense and you know music yeah. being very mathematical in certain ways you know mm. there are just certain equations that work out better than others i guess you know that's absolutely right that's absolutely right and it, you know sometimes you're lucky and sometimes you're not i mean I remember you mentioned Mutt Lang. It's funny when, in fact, it connects with Lena Lovitch. When I was working on her second album, we were at um, Visload Studios in Hilversum. I don't know if you, you've heard of it. I've been there, yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, pretty pretty cool place. Mm -hmm. And we were in, we'd moved from the big room, Studio One, to I think it was the middle room, two. And <laughs> Mutt Lang was going to record with... Um, Bob Geldof, what was the band that they were at the time? Boomtown Rats. Boomtown Rats. Mm -hmm. yeah. And um, the band hadn't turned up yet, but um, Mutt and his engineer had spent four days just moving a microphone and a snare drum around the studio and banging it <laughs> because <laughs> he couldn't get the sound he wanted. And, and the engineers were all saying, you know, it's just crazy. He's been there for five days and all they do is hit the snare and <laughs> they change the microphone and they move the position and they dampen it and they make it live. And he wasn't happy. And then I get a, a, a head poking around the corner and he and his engineer are like, can we hear something you did next door? I said, sure. They came in and I played some drum track for them and they just kind of looked really dubious and were like, yeah, it's not right. And walked out. <laughs> I just Ooh. felt it was very rude and actually quite insulting. But uh, and then they didn't. They didn't finish. Then they left. They obviously decided the room. And this was a big orchestral room, if you remember. And uh, they just I'm, couldn't I'm, get it together. 
I'm surprised they couldn't find a drum sound they liked in that room. That was actually a really nice room, as I recall. It was a really, really nice room, wasn't it? I know. Mm -hmm. I remember I did, um, we worked with Costello, actually. We worked on the Get Happy album there in that room. And um, I also cut the uh, last Undertones album I worked on, the third album of theirs. We, we did that in that room. Um, although I ended up mixing it. Um, where did I end up mixing it? I went to mix it in Eden. We had problems with the way they'd done something about their speakers and, the, and hadn't told people. <laughs> it didn't, didn't quite work out. Everything was very bass heavy. So I remixed it at, um, at Pete Townsend, well, not Pete Townsend, the Who's studio in Wandsworth. I forgot what it was called. The Ramport. Mm -hmm. Ramport Studios with his lovely old wraparound Neve. Um, we ended up mixing it there, which was quite nice. And in fact, I did some of Get Happy there as well. Now, what is your own, um, what is your own background? Tell me a little bit about that because you know, clearly you have some musical background, but you're also, um, you're very, you know, you're, there are a lot of producers who like to be completely hands off. And then there are others mm. who like to really be hands on and, mm. you know, mix the left brain, right brain engineer producer roles. Mm. And you're really more of the latter, I think. What's your, what's your own background and how did they, how did they merge for you? Um, my background, well, I mean, I, I, like many people, I think when I was very young, my parents, we had a piano at home and my parents uh, wanted me to learn how to play the piano. And so we had some of that. What I discovered at a very early age is that I have a good ear. So, um, you know, my piano, I'm sure a lot of people do this. My piano teacher would play something and I just played back yeah. without bothering to read the music. That's, that's and, how I learned uh, as well. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So I used to do that. And we had one thing I remember is we had a radiogram, one of those big old, you know, huge pieces of furniture. Uh -huh. And my my father used to love um, jazz. He'd bring back jazz stuff from from France or Germany, or whatever. And the thing that really I loved about it was I discovered if you lay on the floor, just underneath the loudspeaker, you could hear the bass end. It was really big, and I love bass. That's that's obviously something that was burnt into my dna at an early age as you can tell i do as well yeah i saw <laughs> i've been looking at them <laughs> so that yeah that's one of the things i think I, I i think in the early days i always mixed bass a bit too a bit too high it was always very forward with the kick but um i was very interested in music and i didn't know what to do with myself but i started getting very interested in uh in recordings when i was able to start buying albums um I'd save up to buy the latest, I don't know what, Beatles album or something. And um, I was very interested in where things were recorded. I suddenly discovered, oh, it's a studio. What is this place? And the engineers' names and, and producers' names. And I, I decided I had to be an engineer. I had to kind of be. I'll tell you what turned me on to it all was um, the, the penny went drop, the light bulb went off. It was actually Beach Boys' Good Vibrations. I must have worn the record out on the first day I got it. I just... It was the layering of all those vocals and all the different oh, parts sure. and the changes and the cuts. I, it just blew my mind. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. And I mean, I was into the Beatles, but there was nothing quite like what they'd done. It was like magic. And I just, at that point, it's like, I have to be able to do this. I have to be able to make things like this. It's just, it's too amazing. Mm. And so then I started, you know, the quest for trying to get into a studio. You know? So oh. I had, but I had, um, I actually started off cutting vinyl, <laughs> which is uh, an interesting thing. Um, That'll teach you things you won't learn otherwise. Yeah, it certainly does. It didn't last too long. And then training, but I started off with, um, it was four track studio. Mm -hmm. And you know the, the whole process of recording four and then bouncing to two and then back again. So sure. I got into all of that. And of course there were lots of bands and producers that came through the door and I, I basically made the tea and the coffee and uh, ran down the road to buy something to eat so that i was able to hang out and watch all these people work and you know learn about their mic why they made choices for particular microphones and things like that so when we moved and um they took me with them thankfully even studios um and we started with a 16 track studio suddenly it was you know we had our own board a custom board as well and the guys that ran the place you know really wanted me to understand because they were they were trained by the bbc so they had this kind of real you know grounding in in understanding of the tools of your trade the lab code um, guys yeah yeah exactly so they were mm -hmm. very keen for me to understand all of that so 
I really have to thank them a lot for, you know, at an early age kind of getting into compressors and understanding EQ and, uh, you know, why you'd use it or when you'd use it and, mm. you know, the, the way different microphones behave, all that kind of stuff, which I've, I'm still crazy for trying out silly mics and things. Um, but I, I think what it was is I just had this kind of urge to tell people to try something. <laughs> I slowly started to do that and, you know, trying to be as discreet as possible. And it turned out that people quite liked some of the ideas I had. So they, they, they've liked me engineering for them. They, they liked what I was doing. Although I was generally when I started absolutely terrified of everything I was doing. Um, and every now and again, I'd sort of, if there was a problem going on, I'd, I'd throw out a comment. Oh, what about if you did it this way? I was like, yeah, actually, that's a cool idea. And I, actually, it was amazing that people would listen to me. That was the, that was the real thing, is rather than saying, shut up. You know? um, and that's how it started, really. I started to kind of edge my way in. But I got, it, I got um, really where it took off was at Stiff Records, when I got in, involved with Dave Robinson and Stiff Records. Dave was just sending me tape after tape after tape to mix, just lots of different things to mix. And he'd book in studios all over London, and I just disappear and do stuff. And of course, I'm mixing stuff, so I'm now starting to put my own interpretation onto things. And so that's kind of where it all started to grow. And then people actually asked me to um, co-produce stuff with them, and and that was kind of it, really. I think, but it was a. I mean, I'm sure you know yourself from trying to get into studios and trying to make a. A name for yourself it's it's a really long <laughs> arduous process it is and there are some great people there's some great people that you meet um you know some really wonderful engineers and you know that did the most amazing things and stuff i'd never would have dreamt of um and people that would say yeah you know come and help out you know which is which is fantastic and it's sad now i think about you know so many youngsters who want to be engineers that want to make records that don't have the opportunity any longer. I mean, how many studios, you know, bring in guys off the street, you know, teenagers, whatever, you know, well, and, hey, and come to sit your in point, session. Yeah, and, and to your point, you know, you just talked about the idea of being able to glean all of this technical information from yeah. guys in the lab coats. But mm. at the same time, I think um, one of the things that was very valuable for me, and I'm sure it was equally valuable for you was the stuff you learn besides that you know i mean it is absolutely and i think it's it's i mean i see courses you know, learn how to be a record producer i just think how what, what do they actually teach it's 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 so much to do with um it's almost like general social skills i think in a way you know if you get on with people that's a start, but it's, you know, understanding the kind of ideas that you may want to put forward, whether they're actually valid or not, is, is really difficult. I don't think anyone can teach you that. It's something you either, you understand intrinsically or you don't. Um, I mean, I, you know, I've made a lot of faux pas in my, in my life and uh, made some big bad errors, but, you know, you learn as you go on and that's, that's what it's all about. It's like film directing. You can go and learn how to be a director. You can understand all the technical aspects. And it's a very complicated process being a director. You don't just stand there and say action. But, you know, and, and in the same, well, in a, in a more complex way, actually having a script and envisaging the, the life of this, of this script. Big um, picture thinking. I can't begin, yeah, I can't yeah. begin to imagine what goes through a director's head, how you get to that point. And I don't know how you can teach that. I think it's like any artist. I think it's like any creative person in whatever the, whatever the medium or the discipline is. You know, you have, uh, you have that spark and you just need the kind of the tools really to help drive that and, and bring you out, um, you know, to then do that kind of work. So yeah, teaching I find bizarre, but you're right. I think a lot of it is to do with, I mean, that's an interesting thing because I've never, I understand, um, you know, the, the technical stuff, the machinery, the, you know, the outboard gear and the desks and the machines and the pro tools and everything else. And but to me, none of that's important. I mean, I, I used to have this thing, you know, I can record. In fact, I did. You know, you can record something on a cassette, you know, sure. but if it, 
if you have the if you have a decent mic and you have a great performer, it'll sound great. It doesn't. Really and sometimes matter. you'll never you'll never recreate the demo. Exactly. I mean, I recorded on an album once. I was sitting in the control room. The artist uh, said, "I got this idea for a song. I don't know whether it's been kicking around for a while. Let me just play to you." And he just <clears throat> we were sitting in front of the desk in a fairly big control room. And he started playing me the song and just singing it really, really gently. And I was like, this is great. I said, do it again. And I just got my iPhone, <laughs> I swear. <laughs> and I just, I recorded, I had a microphone, you know, one of those little plug-in mics for it. And I just recorded it on the iPhone. And it ended up on the album. That was it. We just, I mixed it with some, you know, put some effects. It was all over the, you know, the guitar and the voice. But it worked really well. And it was a great performance from him because there was nobody there, it was a very gentle thing. And he was really just singing to me in a way, and it was fantastic. And that's, you know, you, as you said, you don't need stuff. You, you, what you need is talent. And you need a kind yeah. of, you, you need, um, what's the word? That excitement, you know, to drive you to do something, you know, to achieve yeah. something. Yeah. Which well, gets you know, difficult as you get older <laughs> to well, keep that, to keep that spark enough. going, I have to say. True enough. Although it's, it's interesting, you know, you, you mentioned the whole technology aspect of it. And to me, I've always found that kind of fascinating, too, because, mm. you know, um, now, you know, my first home studio was a, a TAC reel to reel four track, you know, mm. and I think, you know, and I've had this conversation with a number of people, I think I, in certain ways, was more creative with that because yeah. you're given certain limitations and you have to use those limitations, mm. you know, by virtue of the fact that it's more limiting, it can actually be more creative. I think you're absolutely right. I mean, I, I look at things like, um, actually I was watching a video of, uh, with Michael Brower the other day, talking about something or other they, they were working on. And, you know, he's, he's very good. And there was a cut where it, it looks, there was a side shot, and there's like 500,000 compressors. <laughs> God knows what. I just thought, how can you ever use all this stuff? Why do you have, why do you need to have 10 Yuri compressors? You know, you don't need all this. And I, I swear, I honestly don't think it makes anything better. I really don't. Um, that's a sweeping statement, I know. But I remember one time a guy saying to me in the studio, we'd run out of tracks. He said, I can't put anything more. We've had more tracks. Left. He offered me 20 pounds. I said, oh, go on, just give me another track. I said, no, no, there are no more tracks left on the <laughs> tape. <laughs> it's only 24. And he was like, oh, go on, go on. <laughs> it's bringing another Unbelievable. machine. <laughs> exactly. Well, my God, I'd never go through that again. But the... But that's the thing now, you know, there's so, you can do so many different things. You can have, uh, you know, a dozen different plugins and all this stuff that, you know, do you really need all this? I mean, I, I don't know about you, but I have like, I have a little battery of, of things that I use, my plugins, apart from the outboard stuff, a few plugins. Um, and I'll check new things out as they come along and see whether they're worth it or not. I think a lot of it is aimed at, um, bedroom producers actually i think that's the, the tragedy there's so much rubbish out there sold to people and they really shouldn't be wasting their money on on some of it is agreed awesome. agreed but there's some there are some cool things you know and and very useful things oh i mean there are you know one of the things i am very very grateful for is some of the technology that we mm. now have the opportunity to use you know to clean up certain things you know i'm oh, absolutely. a big fan of you know the isotope stuff for example to clean up mm you know, certain tracks or dialogues or whatever. But ultimately, when you're talking about the creative process, mm. um, less really seems to be more in a lot of senses. Yeah. Well, it's always, the, it's the same thing, isn't it? If you have, if you have great performances and you have a great song, you know, sure, you can embellish it and you can, you know, bring it out and make it shine. But, you know, you, there's no need to kind of go over the top and be crazy. I think I'm kind of going around in circles a little bit, but it's like you know oh we have another we can have 200 tracks to record on let's record yet another guitar part it's that sort of thing which I, that mentality i think that people have got too too easy with you know and i know a lot of bands um a lot of big bands to this day that still indulge because they cannot just say that's it and that's a really difficult thing and it has got you know i've had stuff sent to me and i've sent it back saying I will not mix this until you get rid of, make some decisions or I'll make them for you. And you might not like it. And sure enough, you know, it's quite easy to make the decision. They send it back to me and say, I think we prefer these, good. 
and then you can work on it. But it's just crazy. It, yeah, the, the so much when choice. it's done, you know, it's, a, it's yeah. and I, I think that is one of the one of the jobs of a, of a producer is to basically yeah. say, OK, you know what? We can keep working on this and we'll make it different, but we may not make it any better. Well, it's an insecurity, isn't it? I think yeah. the insecurity of being able to say, you know, I like this mm -hmm. um, in the face of everyone else saying, I'm not sure I do. Um, it's like, you know, a and R guys, you know, from I remember, you know, years and years and years of having to put up with, you know, yeah, I think we need another mix. Why? You know, yeah, I, you know, there's this guy. He's doing some great work. Um, he does rap. This is a rock song. So <laughs> you have all these crazy things constantly thrown at you, and it's. I'm sure it still goes on. How many times have you tweaked a, a non-existent channel just to satisfy an A&R guy, you know? Oh, I think oh I've done more than more that. Snare. You know, I've, I've, I've done that. I've reached for a channel that wasn't really engaged and, you know, I just, oh uh, yeah, much better now. You that know? sounds better, yeah. <laughs> I did, uh, I mastered, I, I, I remastered a whole album once. <laughs> I went back to the mastering studio. I was like, they want us to do it again. And we, just for the life of us, was like, there's nothing wrong with this. And so I just sent the same thing back and they loved it. <laughs> it was like, it's so much better. And it's, it sounds like, a I mean, that's not something I do as a matter of course, I did it once. And because uh, I was so frustrated with them. But um, yeah, it's, it just shows how people, you know, a lot of the listening goes on in your brain. It's not, you know, it's, there's a lot of stuff that your brain likes to fill in and, and move around. So it's sure. quite, sure. you know what it's like when you, when you, um, you walk into a new control room, a new pair of speakers, and it just sounds weird. Everything's wrong. But then within two hours or so, it's like, yeah, this is cool. You know, your brain sort of fills in the gaps and you yeah. start to, it, it sounds the way you expect it to sound after that, you know. Yeah. It's yeah. So, so do thing. you mainly work in a, still in a, a sort of an old school fashion, so to speak? I mean, do you try and impose those limitations? Uh, to a degree, yes. Um, I mean, <clears throat> I don't... Uh, You know, the, for me, it's all about having fun too. I mean, th I think it should be an enjoyable process. One would hope. Um, one would hope, yeah. Well, sometimes, of course, it, but you know, it should be an enjoyable process and everybody should be enjoying the parts that they're involved in. And generally, I think if, you, if you're able to create that environment, and of course these days it's harder and harder because people are not generally going into a studio. They're yeah. to do things, especially over the pandemic. I mean, I had a drummer in, west of west of the uk i had a guitarist in los angeles another one in boston a keyboard player in in the cotswolds here i mean it was crazy but actually worked but um yeah getting people in a room together is always a really hard thing and it's it, to me it's always it's never been about the technology it's always been about is this a nice environment to play in you know that's always the thing yeah and uh, i don't like flashy rooms i don't like rooms that I like rooms that are quite plain because then you can put your stamp on it, you know. And I, I think um, I think once you have that, then there isn't really so much of a once people relax and they lose their anxiousness about what they're doing. Because you know, ultimately, for an artist, it's difficult because it's printed, and that's it. Yeah. You know, that, yeah. There's no going back. This, that's my song. So it is. A, it's a very stressful process. I think for a lot of artists, can get very, very strung out by it, but. I think, you know, so long, when people are relaxed and they start to see that, yes, I'm really enjoying this, this is what I want to hear, then there isn't the need to have another 20 guitar parts or let's redo the drums or whatever. Um, and that's, that's always been the thing, you know, that's, I think no matter how you work. I remember listening to Jack White, um, that he won't record in anything other than an eight track. It's like, well, just limit yourself to eight tracks. Just say no. It's <laughs> it's quite easy, you know. I'll say no for you. It's not a difficult thing. Mm. Um, but you know, I understand. I understand what he's saying absolutely, and I think he's right to, to a degree. It was a little extreme, but you know, he's making a point, and I think it's quite valid. But yeah, I think it's um, and that's the balancing act that you that you were talking about earlier. I mean, I think trying yeah. to get people. The balancing act of, of having people relaxed about what they're doing, but at the same time trying to get the best out of them, um, and and gently steering them in directions that you you hopefully feel, well, that you feel are going to be better and encouraging them, and you hope is actually going to end in a in a much better result. Um, yeah, those and, are the, the things that you learn over a long period of time. I think. 
Yeah, and it is a balance, and and you know the technology obviously is part of it, no question yeah. about that. Mm -hmm. But yeah, you're right. I think you know it it doesn't really it doesn't really impact it unless you start going really down the rabbit holes, so to yeah, speak. You know, and let's mm -hmm. let's try this next patch and see what it sounds like. You know, and mm -hmm. four hours later, you haven't gotten anything done. No, that's right. I mean, I, the, the the one of the scary things is the. Um, recording to tape still i think i fired him when you've been doing that recently or not but no i did actually record some yeah. hmm? no undo key <laughs> <laughs> that's quite right i recorded some drums um i was asked to do um uh, record some drums for a drum sampling company um really good i mean they they provide the whole pro tool session plus individually cut beats and stuff and you can Turn them into RX files and all of that. And they wanted Pete Thomas to play from, from the attraction. So I, I, Pete happened to be in London and I called him and said, Have you got a day? And he did. So we managed to get into a room. And but they wanted to record the drums to to tape, to analog. So like, okay, so we had a room with a with an Atari, I think, uh 24 track, um, new tape and everything. And I was I have to say, I did think they sounded really, really good coming back and they wanted that old Costello sound. So we had the very high tuned snare, uh -huh. <laughs> the sort of trash can sounding tom toms and things. And it was like, wow, it sounds just like it did 30 years ago. With that. <laughs> but, um, and it did sound great off tape, but, you know, it really did. But I think that if you're careful or thoughtful about the environment you're in, the kind of microphones you use, the sort of EQ you're using, it's very easy to over brighten everything these days, I think. You know, digital sounds great. I'm really happy to just work on, uh, you know, on Pro Tools and work digitally at a decent resolution. And um, and I think it, to me, it's just, it's so easy. It's more relaxing. Like you said that, you know, you can undo, which is wonderful. Right. Um, you know, and I'm not, I'm not crazy about um, chopping everything into time because I, I hate the way that can lose a feel. I, I'm not crazy about doing lots of edits. I'd rather... If you can get a tape, great. But even with multi-tracks, and you know, back in the day, we were chopping tapes, you know, cuts together to make a tape. So it's not like something new. It's, it's been going on since the beginning of time, I'm sure. So um, I'm really happy. I, I, I really enjoy working with uh, with digital. Um, I'm actually in the process of transferring a whole bar pile of of tapes. In fact, one of them is the monkeys. <laughs> um, <laughs> that I have all these masters and I'm, I'm kind of really worried they're going to end up just dust. So, right. So you're archiving. Transferring. Yeah. yeah. I'm archiving all of them. I don't know what to do with the tapes after that though. They're taking up a lot of storage space. So, you know, that, and that's, that's another thing too, you know, to a certain extent, I mean, the whole analog versus digital war, you know, mm -hmm. we know the digital one a long time ago, but uh, yeah. You know, I'm I'm not necessarily nostalgic for a lot of that stuff because, quite frankly, yeah. a lot of it was a pain in the ass. You know, I mean, yeah, totally. And you know, lugging around half a dozen boxes oh, of two-inch tape. More. You know, <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, and it's just just it. I'm I'm much happier having the whole thing on a little drive right now. Thank you very much. You know. Yeah. No. Absolutely. I. <sighs> I'm not nostalgic in any way at all. And I think when I talk to people, sometimes they're quite surprised by that. They assume because of my, my age and my past that I want to work everything analog. It's like, no, I'm, I'm really happy with this medium. I mean, I think you know, we all moved on from four track, you know, to, yeah, yeah. to or from the wax disc to, to <laughs> wherever we are now. I don't see that it's a, an imposition. I mean, it would be great if we had astonishing uh, recording and reproduction like analog, you know, they have the same kind of transients, and it's getting there, but it's um, it's a long way off. But I don't think it it falls down because of it in any way. No, someone will I come up it's... with a plug in for it sooner or later. You know. Oh God, no, not with a plug in. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so I, I want to circle back to um, one of the things we were just talking about regarding working with the artist, um, because a lot of the artists that you worked with, hmm. there was an evolution over the period of time you worked with them. And Elvis is a great mm. example, you know? Yes. Um, yeah. Even though, you know, to a certain extent, it appears by listening to his recorded work that he emerged fully formed, that's not the case at all, obviously. Nobody does. And I think, you know, when we talk about the, the whole idea of the dynamics of working with the artist, mm. 
Mm. Can you talk to me a little bit about how the relationship evolves as the artist evolves? You know, Elvis is an example, Nick Lowe, another example mm. of people who I think during your tenure with them, obviously mm. became more complex in mm. their own endeavors. How does that change the dynamic of you working with them? Yeah, I think um, it was uh, uh, the first time I met Nick. I mean, I think the Costello stuff was easier because I had been working with Nick previously on quite a few projects. Um, and so we had a relationship already and had become quite good friends. So, you know, that and that helps. So there was a, you know, there was a reliance, you know, he, he would give me cues and he just let me go off and do whatever I wanted in a way. So the he trust never, was there. Never, yeah, he never worried about uh, the sound of stuff un unless it was something that he particularly wanted to hear. So that, that was really good. So I had great freedom. So working with um, Elvis was interesting. I think the when we first got together, because it was the first major thing. I mean, Elvis had already made one album, but um, this is model, I think, was um, a turning point for him anyway at that, you know, now he had the band, um, there was the budget, you know, and it was um, and the, the songs were much sound more and the yeah. sounds, yeah, they were more, yeah. more fully formed in a way, I suppose. Um, well, he was finding himself, I guess, to an extent, finding his feet. But I mean, each each album had a, a completely different topic, I think, also. So there were, you know, he moved with his own changes. And, and again, you know, we became, with the whole band, we all became very relaxed with each other. You know, we all had our roles to play. Um, and after that record, I think by the time we finished that record, you know, we were all felt good about working with each other. And so when we came to Armed Forces, it was it was like it was easy. It was like a relationship. You know, it's, it's now it's easy. Mm -hmm. So there was no sense of um, everyone was relaxed about performing. Elvis was always really relaxed about performing, more so by then. Um, and, and I was I was more able to actually start pushing things myself as well. You know, I think with with Nick, I, there was a lot more suggesting and, and kind of producing mm -hmm. from me. Um, on some of those things, I you know I did I would take stuff home and do edits and then come back and say what do you think I think this is really good and he, you know sometimes he liked it sometimes he didn't um, but yeah and also <clears throat> like harmony parts and stuff like that I was really into so we started to have this much more kind of open relationship I think and I think that kind of helps too because I think when I think when artists realize that or start to, to see that you're relaxed in their company on a more social level, I suppose, rather than it just being about the work, then, um, you know, in their presence in the room, I think that does, that does change the dynamic because there is a, there's, there's complete lack of um, anxiety, I guess, or, or fear of the unknown. Um, you know, I could have stuff thrown at me and I, be perfectly happy to try answer whatever and in the same way i could throw things at them and they would be happy to respond in a, in a, in a similar way so it started to make a big difference by the time we got to get happy i think everyone was so worn out actually <laughs> the band had come off the tour they were it was it was an interesting title because everyone was actually so fed up with everything i mean a, passi a passivity there yeah it was it was quite a hard it wasn't a difficult record, but we, I mean, well, to give you an answer, uh, an example, I don't know if this is common knowledge, but uh, Jake Riviera, who managed everybody, um, we were halfway through the record, more than halfway through the record, and he came over to visit us. And we were staying at this very swanky um, kind of motel just outside um, Utrecht. And uh, they had like, um, like a Michelin star chef. And it was... It was an amazing place, but incredible selection of wines. <laughs> that that probably Jake helped. Came over, we're, yeah, he went crazy. <laughs> We'd spent 10,000 quid at, at, just on bar bills. Wow. <laughs> it's just a, that gives now you that's an, idea an inspired where, album. <laughs> yeah, so that gives you an idea of where our heads were at on that uh -huh. record. And everyone was just, I think, quite exhausted. You know? I mean, I, I was 
almost burnt out and Nick was quite tired. We were all really tired by it. So when we came back to England to mix, it was, um, but the thing was, you know, we were all able to, <laughs> we were all doing the same thing. You know, I'd have lunch with Elvis, you know, everybody had disappeared somewhere or other. Let's start in the studio late tomorrow. <laughs> we're all gonna have a hangover. So I find myself, you know, having lunch with, uh, with EC and we just chat about stuff. And then I, we get in the car and I drive to the studio we drive to the studio and we'd start again. And it, it started to become a little bit like um, like hard work, I think. Not so much hard work, but, you know, it, there, were, there were days when it was a slog, I think. We'd rather all have been away to, mm. on a beach, sunning ourselves. But it was a it was an interesting record. It actually, I think it turned out to be one of the best albums that he did. Oh, it, it got terrible reviews at the time. I mean, I, I think it's one of his best works, absolutely. Um, but, you know, I, I think it's interesting. You had mentioned earlier that uh, your wife has a degree in psychology. She's a psycho. Yeah, she's a psychoanalyst. Yeah. Not, and, not psychology, psychoanalyst. Psych psychoanalyst. Well, that's that's even more to the point, because I think, you know, to a certain extent, you do pull from those kind of skills <clears> in, you know, sort of reading the room, reading the individuals mm. that you're working with. Mm. And I would guess that that would even happen with people you know well, you know, that you yeah. have a long-standing relationship with because the dynamics change each time. Oh, absolutely. I mean, you have to be, it's, it's, it's my daughter's actually a psychologist and my wife's a psychologist, so it's kind of, I'm in the middle. My, my, um, my, my daughter is now, uh, has just gotten her degree in, in uh, psychology as well. So I'm, I'm, I, I understand how it is to be analyzed. You know what it's like. You do, yes. Absolutely. Dad, absolutely. you know, the reason yeah. you're doing that is because. Yes. Yeah. Shouldn't you rethink what you just said? Oh, okay. <laughs> um, so, but that's interesting. I, I have always been, I, in fact, I used to joke that, you know, producers more of a psychiatrist with, with the band than not. Absolutely. But, you know, sometimes, I mean, there was one band in particular, I'll never forget, that um, they were great. I used to have various members come to me when nobody else was around and tell me what they didn't like about what was going on. And then I get another one saying, it's like, oh, God. And I'd be trying to, try to hold this whole thing together. Actually, you know, we made a good record, but it was... Um, that was really weird. I remember the engineer at the time said to me, how do you deal with this? I don't know. <laughs> I just take it one step at a time. But, you know, you do have to kind of, you do have to an analyze in a way. I mean, I think that's quite interesting. I never really think about it, but I think there is a sense of, you know, you're, you're kind of, you're trying to tune into everyone's um, wants and needs, you know, and everyone has their own needs. Um, and sensitivities and whatever. And you have to respect that. You have to kind of be careful with some folk and not as much as that with others. And so there's definitely a dancing game that, that's played, I think, in, in, in a lot of sessions. True. And especially when you're when you're dealing with a band where you know it's not it's not one person's band. Everybody in the band is their own personalities too. And you may bond with one very differently than you bond with another, for example. Totally, totally. <laughs> I think that's absolutely right. Yeah, that mm -hmm. does happen. That absolutely does happen. I mean, I managed um, uh, a very successful band, uh, Bell X One, in Ireland for, for about 10 years. And uh, I produced, actually produced the Breakthrough album, which was, <laughs> which was great. Um, and that was interesting because I had my manager hat on, but I also had my producer hat on. So wow. in the morning I did all the kind of managerial bullshit and then yeah, yeah, the album's going great. Don't worry, it's going to be one. We'll deliver. <laughs> and then I'd be in the studio working with the guys. Oh, bloody hell. This sucks, right? <laughs> yeah. What do you mean you're coming over to listen? You know, so. Um, but that was interesting because, uh, you know, the, the actually it was the, the head of the label that suggested I, I make the album. We were looking for a producer and everyone that they wanted was either not available or, or didn't, want to, didn't want to work on the record. Um, and thankfully it was successful. But I had quite a, the relationship shifted, I think, during that record. And you're quite right, the different relationships with different man, band members. Um, and it kind of, it kind of loosened everybody up, I think, after that, after the album was finished as their manager. It was, um, I think it was a little easier for a while. Mm -hmm. But it's, you know, it's, um, they do shift. I think if you're involved with the band for a long time, it shifts. 
you know, it can shift up and down like any relationship. Sure. There's good days and bad days. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it's, it, but you're, you know, it, over the years, I mean, Costello was a good example. I think over the years we all, um, well, the, ba- you know, the band had their own issues with, uh, with management and within the group. Uh, I got fed up with working with Nick. <laughs> Um, we actually made trust in two bits. Like there were some songs he wanted to to work on as producer, and there was stuff that I wanted to work on as producer. And I actually started the album. I did Clubland, which is the first track we recorded, um, and that's for me set the tone of the record. And then Nick would go in and do stuff. I didn't want to be with him anymore in the studio, so he would. <laughs> neither of us did, so he would go in and do stuff, and uh, I'd set it all up, and then I'd kind of just hang out. <laughs> and, but then we came back and mixed it together. Yeah, Nick Nick had a similar experience, I believe, with um, one of John Hyatt's records. He he ended up producing one side of it, and uh, and uh, a couple of other gentlemen that I knew in San Francisco produced the other side. Oh, and, interesting. Uh, you know, again, I mean, Nick is definitely um, he's one of the ones I think of when I think of how the dynamic must have changed for you because he really. Um, I think at one point did become, I don't want to say a lone wolf, but he's definitely very, um, you can tell, I think, by the nature of his productions that he's probably pretty headstrong in terms of what he wants and seeing the big picture yeah. and being directed to go he for is it. Quite, he is quite headstrong in, in many ways. I mean, he's a musician and a writer, so that, mm-hmm. you know, that helps. Sure. Um, but a lot of times he's really just, uh, I mean, one of the things I learned from him was getting the band vibed up in the studio. He was mm-hmm. very much into, you know, everyone had to be vibed up and blah, blah, And that's true. Um, but his way was, he would get very animated as well and, and very excited about stuff, which is, you know, that's how he worked. That was great. Mm-hmm. Um, but as you know, from experience, I'm not like that. Um, but I do want to, to get some kind of vibe happening in the, in the studio with the band. Um, well, you do it in a more passive sense, I think. You know, yeah, I do. And I, jumping I, up and down and, you know. Yeah, I, I couldn't really get into that. But, you know, that, that, was, this, that, was the, um, that was the difference between us. But I did learn a lot from him when, mm. in the early days when I started. And when we did um, the first record I did with him, is the Jesus of Kula, uh, which was, we recorded some new songs, but a lot of it he'd already recorded and they were eight track and we transferred it to 16, I think, and then did some embellishing and, and mixing. And then we recorded stuff from scratch, um, like Breaking Glass. I mean, that was a really interesting song because I ended up, there's a, there's a part in Breaking Glass where there's uh, this kind of chant, om, and I've been doing that with Lane Lovitch, and I just felt it sad. So I said, "We've got to do this." So I ran into the booth, and I did these um, did these chants, and and I had this idea for this crazy manic tambourine, and it was great that he let me do these. I mean, that was that was the great thing about him at the time. It's like, yeah, go on, let's do it. So, you know, that was the kind of spirit that I that I think I took from him. It's like, yeah, let's see where it goes. Um, and he was, yeah, he was great to work with, actually. I really enjoyed working with him. And through Rockpile, all the stuff that he did with Rockpile and David. Yeah, I was, I was going to say the Rockpile thing also, because you have, there you have a lot of very disparate personalities, I think. Oh, totally, yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and I, I, I'm, I'm sure that that must have influenced it. I mean, uh, you know, um, Dave Edmonds' stuff on his own is quite mm. different, I think. And, you know, I can imagine very. there's a very different personality there. Mm. Well, I did two albums with Dave. I did two solo albums with Dave. And mm-hmm. I learned a lot from him too. I mean, in the recording process, because he was, <laughs> he had this great way of working, which I just can't, I could never get my head around. But he used to like having all the faders just lined up at zero and he'd balance on the inputs. <laughs> on the desk. So, <laughs> so basically if something wasn't quite right, he would just move the fader. So he knew exactly which thing wasn't quite right. Um, it, it was odd. It's like, Dave, I can't work like this. I can't do it. Okay. Um, <laughs> but we had, we had some good fun. And I, he, he was really into mid-range and, you know, on guitars, having that real bite. Yeah, yeah. And um, something which I was probably quite scared about, you know, pushing things too far. But he was a real just turn it till, you know, till it sounds good. He didn't care about DBs or anything. Mm. Um, so I got a lot of that 
Romelza from what was the engineer? Dave Bachelor. Do you remember? Do you know Dave Bachelor? He was one of the Beatles. Another name. He um, he taught me a lot of that stuff. Like you know, don't be scared about this. He was a great guy. I, I was a young engineer, uh -huh. and he was uh, like this god. Um, he was amazing. Crazy things with mics and <laughs> stuff. It was. I did a lot of. I had a lot of good fun with him. Could say a lot of that about yourself as well. Actually, you know, you your your techniques are not necessarily orthodox, um, <laughs> but I think that's that's you know that's part of the magic. And I think um, you know that's one of the things when you when you go back to the whole idea of learning in the studio as opposed mm. to you know nowadays going to a recording school or something like that. Mm. There was a lot of just throw it against the wall and see if it sticks. Yeah, absolutely. And so, you know, to, to, and, and it's, this is a good way to sort of wrap up this conversation. Um, what would you say to today's youth, uh, you know, people coming up in a recording studio now uh, or a recording mm. school now, mm. uh, rather, you know, where they're coming out of there, they're, they're entering into the recording world with a wealth more technical knowledge than maybe yeah. you or I had, but at yeah. the same time, you know, there's, there's other things lacking there as well. Um, mm. What would you advise someone in this day and age who wanted to get into record production? Record production. I, geez, I don't know. I mean, but I'd probably say throw away the rule book, <laughs> you know, listen to your head, listen to your heart, you know, what, sure. what, what really makes you happy? What drives you? And um, I, in fact, a friend of mine was mixing something for, he was working on a pro, he was actually a bass player, but he's a, a producer as well with his own material. But he was producing this character, this, this other guy. Um, and he sent me a mix up too. And I, I said, yeah, I, I, you know, I think perhaps this could be a little better and perhaps think of whatever, just a few things. And he said, I, don't, I just can't get it right. And I, said, I just said to him, what do you want to do? How do you want to make it seem? How do you want it to sound? Because it doesn't matter what, you know, don't ask me for my opinion. Don't ask anyone else. What do you want? You know, he said, it's also subjective, isn't it? Yeah, of course. And it, one of the, the things I think that, that a lot of people have a problem with is wanting to, to have reassurance, wanting to have you know, somebody pat them on the back and say, yeah, it's great. You don't need that. You know, if you're happy with it, it doesn't matter what anyone says. You know, that's great. As long as it's not terrible, of course. Well, and it, and <laughs> but you should it. know if it is. But yeah. It, yeah, it's, it's you know, what what do you want to get out of this as, as, a, as a producer? You know, it, at the same time, respecting the work that you've done with the artist or respecting the artist's work. What do you want? You know, how do you want to make this work? And then go with it, go with those feelings rather than waiting for cues or trying the next plugin. You don't need all of that crap. You just need to, to feel something. Um, and then perhaps the plugin will be relevant, you know, but it doesn't need to be to start with. And well, it shouldn't be the artistic decision. Let's put it that way. Yeah. 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 It goes back to everybody. What... Sorry, go on. It goes back to what you were talking about, about seeing the big picture, I think, you know. Yeah. I mean, I always have, this is an interesting thing. I had, um, when I was working at, at, in Dublin, I, uh, or that's, I don't, one afternoon I was setting up um, a monitor mix. We were going to, to do a guitar overdub or something. So I just set up a, a very rough mix on the board. And, um, and then I flipped to the headphone send and I did a rough mix on the headphone send. And I said, yeah, that sounds pretty cool. And I flipped it back to our monitor mix. And the engineer came over to me and said, what have you done? I said, well, that's, Nothing, I just did a headphone mix. And he flipped backwards and forwards between them. They were exactly the same. And it's that's what's in my head, I guess. Now I'm not thinking about it. I wasn't doing that consciously, but I obviously, that's what I wanted to hear. And I quite subconsciously just twiddled everything until I felt it sounded good. And I'd done the same thing twice. I didn't think about it. It wasn't interesting, but um, it wasn't something I'd planned. I remember Colin saying, how did you do that? I said, I didn't do anything. I just did a mix. <laughs> but he was astonished that it would be the same. And but that's the thing, you know. It's fine. It's finding that in you. You know, it doesn't matter which desk I'd gone to or how many times I'd done that mix. It would have been the same because that's yeah. who I am. Yeah. And you know, when I mix stuff or when I do things, 
um, there's a, there is a thread, and I hear it when I go back and listen to old old stuff that I've done in the past, and I can hear some of the things that must have been in my mind at the time. But there's a definite kind of link to them all in different ways, but there is definitely a thread, and that's that's you know it's finding who you are, it's finding as I said, finding the picture that you want to create, yeah. um, and how to go about doing it, and that just comes from trial and error until until something inside you goes, yeah, I like that, that's good. Yeah, I mean, I tell you the thing that that made me the happiest person in the world. I was talking to Bob Clearman. Uh, I was trying to get him to mix something I'd, I'd done, um, and it was just really complicated trying to get it to happen. And the other thing he said, you know, "Tempted," I think, is the best recording and mix I've ever heard. And I was like, "I'm sorry, what did you say?" But that's I'm not. I'm not showing off in any way, but I that was to, to me, that was manna from God because Bob Clearmountain was my hero. Mm-hmm. I remember hearing a track on the radio one day and I stopped him and I thought, that's got to be Clearmountain's mix. And sure enough, it was. It was some Brian Adams track. And he was a hero of mine. I still, to this day, don't know how the hell he makes reverbs just sit. You know, masses. How does he do that? Yeah. But, you know, I'd love to sit in with him on a mix. And his famous phrase, if you don't get the mix in six hours, move on. You know, which which is wonderful, but uh, I bet he sticks with a mix longer than six hours sometimes. But um, that you know, that's the kind of thing that to me, that's all I needed. Actually, that's that I don't need any more than that because it was that was a he he is a hero of mine. And, well, and and to your credit, uh, I I have to agree. I think Tempted is it's a it's a work of art in so many ways. You know, the lyric is brilliant to begin the with. The lyric is fantastic. Absolutely. Movie you know, and just the way everything sits in the mix, um, everything you captured there was to my mind, the essence. I mean, you know, even when I hear, you know, when I've heard the band do it live, Mm. I still refer back to the recording because the recording was really just a moment in time and very, very brilliant. I think that, well, and thank you for saying that. I think the, the thing that drove it for me was Gilson's drumming. I, just is astonishing it's so and some of those drum have you listened to those drum fills that he had i mean bonkers how did he think of this it's like an octopus hand and (laughs) that you know to me that just drove the song and you know as you said the vocal is great the all the vocal parts are wonderful the lyrics this line's amazing yeah yeah it's it's just great you know Mm -hmm. and it's such a great performance that was like we try I, well, I, I have a tape with about five different versions of that song. We tried it as a country western. We tried it as a <laughs> rock song. We tried it as a, it just didn't work. And every day we try it and they go, oh, just come back to it later. And we do, it nearly never got recorded. Oh my. Mm. And then one day um, we're in the room and who's playing keyboards on that? I can't remember who did that. Was that, was it Steve? Can you remember who played? I can't remember. Um, it'll come to me. Um, it was like, let's try it like this, like a kind of a solely thing. And everyone just clicked. It's like, yeah, this is, and suddenly it worked. And after all this, and it really was one of these songs that, you know, whichever way you tried it, it didn't make sense. It was just horrible. And suddenly it kicked off and Gilson just went for it. His drum part was fabulous. And, you know, how could you make that sound bad? <laughs> let's, well, and, let's and you know, that's, that's interesting because there again, you know, a lot of it points to the creative process and what I what I consider, you know, sort of the, if, if you, if you believe in any kind of a higher power, you know, there's mm. the idea that the, the universe just kind of puts something through us as mm. artists, you know, and yeah. really, you know, you had there all of the perfect conditions yeah. to capture this moment in time. And, Absolutely. you know, I think to a certain extent, I mean, I don't think any of us can really take full credit for stuff like that. You know, the same no, way you, absolutely. you listen to some of the, the most amazing, I mean, even that song, you know, that song as a, as a perfect example, what a fantastic lyric, you know, mm-hmm. and I'm sure just being a songwriter myself, that that lyric, you know, he probably wrote that and turned around later on and went, Jesus, did I write that? <laughs> you know, because sometimes it just comes to you in such a way that you, yeah. you have no idea how it flowed but it just did you know and i think i think it's yeah yeah, i think you're absolutely right i think you're absolutely right and it was you know the stars aligned effectively yeah yeah and we just 
it was it. And actually that track was, um, we recorded it in the morning. Uh, I rented the xylophone. The xylophone's coming with that bit, you know, the riff. I wanted that on, it was a marimba, I think. I wanted it on marimba. And um, that came in the afternoon and I'd mixed it by the evening. So that was all done in one day. Of course. It was just, we just couldn't stop. You know, it was Not one of those surprised. things that couldn't stop. I'm not surprised because that's the way it works when something really yeah. is just flowing. It's just, it's there. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Fantastic. Oh. Well, Roger Basharian, thank you so much for being my guest. It's been quite a pleasure catching up with you and uh, <laughs> really just enlightening conversation to say the least. It's been a pleasure, Daniel. It's been lovely to talk to you. And perhaps our paths will cross again one day. <laughs> before <laughs> too, out, before no, too long. <laughs> Hey, I'm Daniel Keller. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button and join us each week for Insights and Sound.